We're going to be going over a focus talk on the tissue classes of the human body. This is going to be building upon the knowledge that you know that our bodies are built of cells and cells are the definition as a, a unit or a functional structure of life, right? Cells come together and they amass and they generate a tissue. There are four classes of tissues in the human body, epithelial, connective, nervous, and muscular. Your job in the lab is to be able to identify these kind of tissues and know the subcategory. So a lot of this is just recognition, looking at an image, being able to identify a series of characteristics that link up with that subcategory. Epithelial is found all over the body from head to toe. They are found in glands internal. They're also found on your skin. And then connective tissue is the one that is used for support. So tendons, your ligaments, your bones, your blood cells, all these structures that provide structural support. And then we have nervous system, nervous tissue, which is gonna be uh, nerve cells that are excitable. There are many subcategories. For example, inside your cerebellum, you have these cells called Purkinje cells, which are very, very long and elongated. Whereas you might have some smaller neurons in parts of the cerebrum or the hippocampus, but they're all able to excite and then release a chemical called the neurotransmitter, which allows you to send a signal to another neuron. The last class of tissue is called muscular tissue. And this is the one subdivided into three categories. We have skeletal, we have smooth and then cardiac. Skeletal obviously is the one that we all associate with with muscle, right? It's the one that you can move. It's your biceps, it's your latissimus dorsi, your rectus femoris, something to denesis. But these muscles are able to contract to maintain a gigantic amount of load and be able to move your body. Then we also have cardiac muscle, which is used in the heart to move the blood, and then smooth muscle, which has a function of stretching and distension. So one thing I want you to think about as you're looking at any image provided in our lab or in Top Hat is I want you to consider how the slide or how the tissue was created. So when a scientist or when you do a biopsy, right, go to hospital, you do a biopsy, you want to take a piece of that tissue and see if it's carcinogenic, uh, cancerous, you can basically scrape off a chunk of the tissue from the outside or cut a piece of it off. And depending on how you cut it off, you will then have to fixate it onto a slide and that slide will generate an image based on how you smeared it, right? So if you look on this picture on the right, if I were to cut the bone sagittally and smear this in there, you will see the sagittal view, right? You'll see the internal cavity, the lumen of that tube. If I were to cut it across like so, then you would see the opening of the tube, right? The hollow circular part of the tube. So it depends on how the slide gets prepared. And when you look at these images, obviously for an untrained pair of eyes, the secret to getting it trained is to look at it over and over and over so that you recognize some of these images. And one thing I will say is that don't use color of the slide or any image as a characteristic because the color is dependent on how that slide was stained and generated, right? So when they smeared that cell onto a glass slide, you will then add a dye on top of it to stain it, to make it visual, vis visible. And depending on the kind of dye they use, the color will fade over time, right? So if you go to a lab and one of the, the perks about the online lab is that you don't have to, obviously it's a, it's a fun skill, but you don't have to take a slide, mount it on a microscope, and then take five to 10 minutes to focus it. If you don't know how to focus it, you can't see anything. Whereas for our section, I'm just presenting all the images to you to look at, all right? So the first time a tissue that you gotta be able to identify for the lab, is epithelial. So these ones have characteristics of either being single layered or multiple layer. These tissues are always going to be very tightly packed together and they're generally going to be avascular and they have this base membrane where the cells sit on. The base membrane is also what we call the basal surface. This is the bottom area. Think of it like a house. If you're building a house, you have the foundation and then you have the floor, right? That's the basal membrane. And then the roof or the ceiling, whatever you have, if you have tile, if you have solar panels, that's gonna be the apical surface of the cell. So this is a cartoon image of some of the different types. We have simple, that means just means one layer. We also have stratified, which means multiple layers. And then we have some unique cases like pseudostratified. They're like an in-between of them. You have some flattened cells and you have some long cells, right? So you have some unusual unique ones that are found only in certain parts of the body. So the other tip as you're doing your top hat, as you're reviewing these images that I'll, I'll point you out in a second, and as you're listening to this mini lecture, 
is that you want to think about where this tissue was found, what that organ function is, and then predict what kind of tissue, right? Or you could just bluntly memorize. That, that's up to you. And then we can also look at cell shape. So the first shape that we have is going to be squamous, which is almost like a like an egg, right? Like a sunny side egg. It's flat. You can see the nucleus is shown here purple. That's the nucleus, by the way. And then you can see the cell membrane on the outside, and then you can see a cytoplasm uh, contained inside. We have cuboidal, which is kind of like a cube. It's boxy. And then we have columnar, which is a little bit like a rectangle or elongated. So the shapes and then the layering give you a hint. And obviously, when you classify all of them together, you then combine the layering with the shape, and then you have the naming. Right? You have simple squamous, simple cuboidal, simple columnar, stratified squamous, stratified cuboidal, etc. The two that are unusual, the two that you don't see in, on a normal basis, is going to be transitional and pseudostratified. These two are the unique cases where you only find them in specific organ systems. All right, so that's why there are some where you just have to know it, and there's some that you can use your trained eyes to look at the microscope or look at an image and be able to decipher what type of tissue it is. All right. And then over here, what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to show you some images, and these images are, are very, very good. They, these are better than the ones, obviously, inside of the microscope in our lab, because the ones that are in our lab, they've been there for years. And over time and over use, over oxidation, over just moving them in and out and just playing with them, it's going to start fading. But these ones that you see here are from a textbook, and, and they're, they're very, very well colored. So first of all, just know that the, the ones you see here are like the best version of them. The ones you might see in some of the top hat or maybe in our lab, those are the ones from our lab. So they're not going to be as crisp as you want it to be. So the first thing you'll see when you look at any image, and this is histology. Histology is a study of cells, right? So when you see these images, the first thing you should be able to, know to point out and notify is these little round, dark, circular stains. These are all nucleuses, all right? So these are nucleuses of the cell. Another fact that I want you to always remember, and this is going to apply to any image you see, is that when you see an image in the book, in Top Hat, or in the lab, in one field of frame, so if you're looking at this rectangle right now, right, this rectangle that you see right here where I mark with the black marker, you will see more than one kind of tissue. All right, It's not just one tissue in this one view. You will have multiple tissues in this one screen. And that's what gets tricky because you're trying to identify what you're looking at, but then you, there's so many of them, right? So you have to be able to, to point at what I'm asking you, or if I were to ask you, I'll point at something. So over here, you might, have, might see a little bit of, of a damaged bit of adipose or some scraped off epithelial. Over here, we have a basement membrane, right? A sim, simple squamous, thin layer one, layer cell. You can, also, you can only see one layer of nucleuses or one row. And then over here on the bottom, you're gonna see a little bit of collagen a little bit of connective tissue, and maybe even a little bit of smooth muscle in here. So, so there's mixtures of different kinds of tissues in one uh, view, view of the view, all right? And so you just got to get, get comfortable with looking at these images. And this first picture over here, as you see, is a, a simple squamous, which is going to be one row of nucleuses, right? You can see it's only one row. You don't see a lot of nucleuses, and they're very thin. And you can kind of see a little bit of the basement membrane, but it's not really that well colored. But the bottom part where it sits on top, is the basement membrane, all right? So this is the first example. And again, you don't need to know all the characteristics, just recognize what you're seeing. So the secret to this is just looking at the images, spending some time today just looking through it. When I teach the class entirely, I recommend drawing it, but it takes a lot of time. So when I teach this class at the community college, I always require students to draw what they see. And when you draw it once, you generally will form this, this hand-eye coordination and it forms this very powerful memory. So try that out if, if you're trying to find a way to learn. The second one is simple cuboidal. So you can see this one's very different than the one I just showed you right, on the left-hand side. And we're going to look at the, the real one. We're not looking at the cartoon. So these ones, you can see they're boxy. right? They're not perfect squares, but they're boxy. You can see all these nucleuses right, all together. Right? You can see these circles. And you might see a little bit of spacing. So the spacing here represents it's probably a lumen or tube. And one of the classic places to find this kind of tissue is inside the kidneys. There are structures called nephrons, which contain tubes that help you filter your urine. And this is where this is where that comes from. All right. And then if you zoom in, you can't really see this that well in this picture because it's not that strong. But you can see a little bit 
of the hairs, the cilias, on the surface of these cells, right? You can see a little bit of fuzz right there, right, right where my red marker is pointing at, okay? So just some things to point out, this is an example of the cuboidal, simple cuboidal, and the reason why it's simple is because you can only see single rows, right? They're single files, right? This one looks like it's two, but then most of these are single files, right? Single row, single row, they kind of turn together, but single row. These are all single rows, right? So that's why we don't call it stratified. All right, so that's the second type of tissue. The third type of tissue is columnar. This one's a little bit easier. You can see that the nucleuses are a little bit more squashed down, elongated, and the cell is very long and slender, right? It's long. You might even see some additional cells like the globid cells, these are mucus cells. So inside our lungs is a very, very common place to find it. You might see some of this also in your small intestine, the brush border enzyme. They're able to help you absorb stuff. So there, this image that you're seeing here is a picture of a small intestine, cross-section of your small intestine to allow the food products to be absorbed. And these, this kind of a hollow structure right here, this one that I have pointing out with the yellow, is a globid cell. That's what secretes mucus. All right, and then you can also see the thin row of villus, this little hair cell on top. This one's a little bit more noticeable. These are the hair cells. All right, so that's your simple columnar. And the reason why it's simple is because there's only one row. There's not more than one. The next one is a, a unique tissue that you just have to know where it's from, right? You won't find this anywhere else except for in your respiratory tract, your trachea, namely. And this is what we call this PCCE. I, I, I like to give it I like to give it nicknames. It makes it easier to memorize. So PCCE is um, pseudostratified columnar epithelium, ciliated columnar epithelium. You can name it how you like. But you can see, first of all, there's very clear ciliate, cilias that are extended on top of the surface. You can see that they have this very uneven shape of nucleus. Some are very long, some are kind of round. It's like an in-between of squamous and columnar. And then the cells themselves are also very slender, right? Some of them are slender and long. Some of them are kind of at the bottom. So they're a, a mixture. And this is a unique one. So you just have to know where they're from, uh, PCCE. And this is the cells that help you filter the air, right? So when you hear about uh, breathing and respiratory issues, a lot of the debris and the cell particles and, from the environment that comes into your respiratory tract gets brushed out. And there are triggers of cough centers throughout this area. So when you get chemicals lodged in to your trachea, it will cause you to have a reflux of cough. And there are different points in the trachea where those receptors are located. Now moving on, we have the stratified. So this is the first example of stratified squamous. This is basically a picture of your skin. So if you were to zoom into your skin, you can see a layer of dead cells over here. And then on the far right, you have some living cells. And how do you tell dead versus living? Very simple, right? All you gotta do is look at the nucleus. So whenever you hear about dead cells versus living cells, the only thing you can really see is whether or not the cell has a nucleus. So over here, you can see that all these cells are pretty much empty. They look like little, little bags, like little hollow cells without a nucleus. Over here, you can see the purple stains of the nucleus, right? You guys see that? All these nucleuses all scattered around. So you can see that these are living cells on the right and dead cells on the left. And because there's so many of them layer upon layer, we call that stratified, right? So again, just ask yourself, is it one layer or is it multiple layer? And then ask yourself, what shape is it? And then if they give you that information, where do you find it? And with those three information, you should be able to point out what tissue it is. Otherwise, you just don't know what you're looking at, right? And that's why what's really fun about anatomy is that it's all just honestly facts. It's just all there. And if you can spend time reading it and downloading it into your mind, anybody can do this, right? So that's why I, I remember a story when I was, my mom, uh, my mom was a maternity nurse for 10 years and then she career changed. But my, back in Taiwan when I grew up, and this is when I, uh, before I came to the, the United States for my college, my mom would show me this, this, this nursing textbook she had. And she said, oh, I can't speak English, but I just memorize everything and then you just memorize it. So if you can memorize enough words, you can get through nursing school. All right, so that, that's, uh, that's your uh, uh, stratified squamous. And then the next one is over here, non-keratinized. So just depending on if it has a protein keratin, but you can see over here that these cells are alive and you can see very clearly all the nucleuses right here, right? These little circles are nucleuses. So don't use color. Color doesn't tell you anything. It's just how they stained it. We can see all these cells side by side, stack upon each other, right? And then obviously a lot of cells in, in this view. Okay. All right. So let's keep it going. So this is going to be stratified squamous. And then we have a couple more to look at. 
And I'm just showing you some of the key features so that when you're looking at these images, you can use that logic to, to think it through. Stratified cuboidal is a good one. This one is unique because cuboidal cells are found usually in glands or inside the kidney. Okay, so those are the, the general two places you'll find them, and sometimes in your small intestine as well. But this is an example where if you look at this this view, if you look at this, this area where I have the rectangle uh, with the marker, these cells are obviously more than one row. Now you can see there's like two or three rows, sometimes they're kind of collect, uh, stacked on top of each other. And so because there's multiple rows, we call that stratified, right? It's not a very clear single row. But again, when you look at this picture, there are multiple tissues, right? Over here on the bottom right, this is adipose. This is fat cell. This is adipose. And this is what fat cells look like. And then you have some collagen fibers over here, some connective tissue. You have the cuboidal cells over here. And then you have some smooth muscle maybe up here. So you are looking at four or five different tissues in just this view alone, okay? So that, that's why when you look at these slides, it could be very confusing. And on the exams, when you are asked to identify, most, and I'll double check it again, is that there usually will be a pointer or an arrow pointing at this cell, right? So this cell or this tissue, okay? You're not gonna identify this picture because there's so many different tissues involved, all right? Cool, and then another unique one that you just have to know is going to be transitional. This is only found inside the, oops, only found inside the bladder. And this guy is unique because when the bladder is filled with urine and you take a, a smear of that cell type, it's gonna look very different than when the bladder is empty, right? So if you have a ton of urine and you stretch the bladder out, those cells will be compressed down. If the bladder was relaxed, then obviously it might sponge up a little bit more and the cells are more uh, round and fuller. So this is transitional where it literally looks like a mixture of cuboidal and squamous and a little bit of columnar all three. So you can see some of them are, are nice and full over here. And the ones on the bottom look like squamous, but they're all over the place. All right, so the, the pseudostratified columnar epithelium and then the transitional are probably the only two you just have to know exactly how it looks there's no secret to that it's just it's a unique uh, case all right cool so the next class of tissue that i want you to be comfortable looking at and visualizing is going to be connective connective has a function to support organs it's there to bind structures together it also involves movement of proteins but also don't forget all the blood cells in our body the red blood cells white blood cells platelets all those categories fall into connective tissue and the first behind the scene or background that you want to be fully aware of is that the connective tissue is what gives rise to structure, right? So the structure in our body is mostly going to be uh, collagen, protein fibers, elastic fibers, white blood cells, fibroblasts. But these structures that are used to help tissues do their job it includes your immune system cells like your leukocytes, those are white blood cells. Macrophages are the bigger white blood cells that can engulf other cells and, and waste debris. And then plasma cells, which are the cells that generate the B cells or antibodies. And then, of course, the, the ligaments, the tendons, the bones, and then the fat cells in our body. So fat, fat is a good thing. Adipocytes help you have the storage energy, but obviously, uh, you know, if you don't want to have an excess amount of adipocytes either, or be, don't be too overweight. So collagen, reticular, elastic are the three kinds of fibers you're going to see. Collagen is the biggest one. They generally will be thicker in, in size. Reticular are the ones that are found specifically inside lymph nodes in your spleen. And elastic fibers are found inside your lungs for stretching. Right? And then there's a protein that, that has been studied uh, in, in, in the lungs, which is correlated to how well your lungs can stretch and then recoil back. And that stretch is also known as, known as compliance. So you'll learn a little bit about this in 67B, but compliance is when you smoke or if you have lung damage or, or one of the unfortunate outcomes of COVID is when you get long-term COVID and you recover, you've developed scar tissue in your lungs. And the scar tissue and the fibrosis in, in, in your lungs will make it more stiff so that your lungs can't stretch or recoil as well. So what that does to you is you then get shortness of breath and less oxygen, right? So that's why even if you survive COVID, and this is why if you still aren't per persuaded and aware is that it's not about just COVID, it's actually the long-term survival of COVID, your quality of life goes down, right? There's some 
some some issues with the heart, the myocarditis, uh, but the lungs for sure is going to be damaged, right? So your lung capacity will not be the same. There's no way where a COVID survivor gets a better lung after it. It's always gonna be the other, other case. So the first one over here is loose connective. This is gonna be what we call areolar, which is gonna be very uh, sparse and scattered around. You can see over here the nucleus is again of the fibroblast. And then the white clearish fluid substance behind this, all these fibers are gonna be ground substance. And these lines that you see right here uh, the thicker ones are going to be collagen. So the, uh, you can kind of see the darker ones, I guess. The darker lines are collagen. And the thinner, almost like a hair-like strand, those are the uh, elastic fibers. So just know that the only way to decipher between collagen and elastic is the size and the thickness. And that, that's what I will tell you. So the thicker ones are collagen, and the thinner ones are elastic. Uh, the second class is called reticular fiber. This one's a, very, a little bit more unique, and you can see how the fibers wave and undulate. They can zigzag a little bit more, they curve a little bit more, and these are only found inside your lymphatic organs. So your spleen, your lymph nodes, where most of the white blood cells fight, uh, fight the uh, pathogens. All right, so some of these you can use location as a hint. Some of these you just have to look at the image and recognize what you see. And then of course we have the dense regular. Dense just means that it's all really tightly packed, right? The word dense is, a, is an adjective. And the regular means you have a set direction or, or shape. And if you look at this picture, right, you can see all these, all these fibers are going in one direction, right? They're waving in from left to right. You can see kind of the waves versus the one I just showed you, right? If you look at this picture, right? Just look at this picture for a second. This one on the upper right. And I want you to keep this in your mind and now look at this one, right? You can see there is no real directionality to this one. This one, you can see it's going from left to right. And then what you see again is still the collagen fibers. These are all collagen fibers. And some of the, some of the little darker round spots are nucleuses of the fibroblast. And again, they're just all very tightly packed. So you, you also don't see that much light coming through uh, this, the, the image because it's so densely packed together. So tendons that join muscle to bone and ligaments that join bone to bone. And then this one is dense irregular, right? So irregular just means there is no shape. So clearly you can see in this picture that some of these fibers are going downwards. Some of them are going halfway. They kind of twist and turn a little bit. Some of them go up and down. So there is no directionality. And this is an image of your dermis, the under layer of the skin. And we'll go over that next week. All right, the dermis is a classic example of that. Moving forward is then we also have a classic one, adipose fat cells. This one, I hope you don't ever miss this on an exam. Adipose is very clear to spot. It looks like bubbles. The nucleuses are usually on the edges of the cell. These, these are nucleuses that I'm circling around. So these are nucleuses of the cell. And then you can see that it's like a hollow pocket, right? It looks like a little bubble. And as your fat cells increase, right, what happens is the fat cell storage will, will enlarge. So that's why there are uh, a lot of comparisons between like one pound of muscle versus one pound of fat, the fat takes much more volume because of the fact that these cells will swell up. And there is also a, a lot of people that believe in, again, I, I'm curious about what the current status of this is, is that the number of adipose cells that we have is, is pretty fixed. So when you gain weight, let's say you uh, bulk up and you gain weight, and the number of fat cells that you have, as you lose weight, you don't lose the fat cells, you just shrink the size of them. So what happens is that there's this tendency where people that lose weight really rapidly want to hold that weight back is because you still have those fat cells. It's just you're not allowing the cells to store the sugar, right? So you're changing your diet, but then your cells are still there. So the ability for these cells to re release chemicals or bind to chemicals could still be there, which could cause you to to not have a very uh, a prolonged, right? So that's why when you want to lose weight, you want to you want to do it slowly and gradually so your body adapts to it rather than just like a quick extreme diet fast and then you drop weight in a week or something like that. So the next couple of types of connective kind of tissue that we're going to look at is cartilage and bone. These ones are going to be dedicated in a, in a later module as well, but I'll just give you a preview. So cartilage, we have three classes. We have hyalin, we have elastic, and then fibro, right? And of the three, of uh, hyaline is the most flexible and the most dynamic in terms of being able to bend and turn and twist. And the fiber cartilage is the one that has the least mobility. So you have this trade-off of having more mobility means you have less strength. And then the building blocks of cartilage include number one, the chondroblast. These are cells that give rise to the cartilage cells. 
And then the mature cartilage cells are called the chondrocytes. These are the cartilage cells that then reside in these cavities called the lacuna. And these are pockets where you'll, you'll see in a second here. So these are some of the things you can identify when you're looking at the slides. All right, so over here, chyelin is number one. It almost has like a watery or, or quote unquote glassy texture where you can see kind of a, a very, very smooth look to it. You can see the nucleuses again. And that white kind of empty cavity around the nucleus is the lacuna. But you can see they're scattered around. Some of them might almost look binucleated, like they look like the two nucleuses are together. But it almost looks like bubbles, right? Little, little bubbles inside of fluid or liquid. All right, so this is your, your hyaline cartilage. Very, very clear to see. It has like more of a glassy, watery texture. The second type that we have is going to be the reticular. Oh, elastic, sorry. Elastic, you can see over here, a lot more elastic fibers. So in addition to the cells, we have these fibers that are spanning in between all the cartilage cells, right? So it's pretty easy to spot, like little hairs, right? It looks like little, little scribbles. Uh, on, on the slide. And then the last one is fibro, fibrocartilage, which is the one that has the least amount of movement and it has the most amount of durability, but you can see oh, it's a very, very tightly packed where all the cells are close together, or all these cartilage cells are close together, all the chondrocytes, and then the collagen fibers are all very densely packed. Right? You don't see as much room or spacing between the cells. Okay, so just use these images that I'm showing you as a as a textbook uh, uh, image to look at. The, the ones in Top Hat are also really good as well. So if you like the Top Hat ones, use that because those are the ones on the exam. But I'm just going to go off of this because this is very clear to illustrate. And then the last kind of connective tissue that I want to focus your attention to is bone cells. We will have a module that goes over bones later in the semester. But if you look on the upper right, bone cells also have cells, and those are called the osteocyte. One unit of bone cells together is called the osteon. And then in every single osteon, you'll notice there is this dark center called a central canal right here, this dark circle where blood vessels penetrate from top down. So this is why bone cells have the ability to regenerate so well because so much uh, vasculature goes to the bones. And then you'll also see them, these little dots over here, these little, little speckles, these are nucleus of the osteocytes. And then one big circular unit is called the osteon. Right? So it's just a unit of bone cells. Anytime you see the word osteo, that's mean bone. And then obviously, you know, this is a cross section of, 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 the, uh, of the bone. So you're not looking at a sagittal view, but this is a, a cross section, right? This is a transverse. All right, so just be aware that these are some features you can identify. So let's take a look. Um, let me zoom in because this, I don't have a better picture. But over here, you can see, let me use this one. So the nucleuses are right here. These, these little dark stains are nucleuses, right? See the central canal right there, the big circle. Uh, and then this, this, these different areas are called laminae. These are the pockets of space between them. And, and depending on where they're at, they could be what we call the circumferential laminae or interstitial laminae. So it depends on just the location. If it's on the outside of the bone cell, it's circumferential. And if it's in between, it's called interstitial. All right. And then one big unit of these bone cells together, all these osteocytes together, is called an osteon. So that's, that's one unit. This is an osteon. All right, so just be aware, a lot of terminology, when you're looking at the pictures for anatomy, a big chunk of the time is just making sure you know what you're looking at first and then adding those features to that image, right? And that's why what I said earlier is that you don't really need to, to think too much. It's just if you know it or not. And that's why anatomy exams or practicals exams are always times because you're there. If I give you 10 minutes, you're not going to, if you don't know it, you're not going to pull it out of your brain, right? You either know it or you don't. And that, that's why it's clean cut. It's also why it's kind of boring teaching anatomy because there's no, no other thought process involved. And then let's not forget blood cells are also involved as well. So blood cells include what we call the formed elements. There's three classes. We have the erythrocyte, which are red blood cells, white blood cells, leukocytes, and then platelets. Of the three, the only true cell is the white blood cells because they have a nucleus, whereas the other two technically lose their nucleuses. And this picture over here can show you that. And, and you'll see that white blood cells are, are what makes it really fun because they have different shapes. So if you look at the picture on top here, we'll, I'll go ahead and zoom in. Right. So these guys on top here, this guy where it has multi-lobular nucleus, you can see there's one lobe, there's two, there's three, there's almost four lobes. These guys are called neutrophils. These are one subcategory of white blood cells. 
This guy over here on the far right has this gigantic C-shaped nucleus. This is called a monocyte. And then these guys with a circular nucleus is called a, um, usually a lymphocyte or a basophil. They're, they're just simple round nucleuses. So the way to decipher between white blood cells is looking at the kind of nucleus that they have. So when you go do a, a blood count or if you do a, a run a lab, a technician or somebody that's trained will look at the cells of your smear and look at how many of these white blood cells they find based on the number of other cells in that view. These other cells you see in the background, these are all robot cells, RBCs. They kind of look like donuts, right? You can see the red, reddish color on the outside and then it's kind of hollow in the middle. And platelets are over here, some of the chips.